Jamovi is an open source free statistical software program and I am going to show you how to use it to do a regression analysis. So if you don't have Jamovi, go to the website jamovi.org and download it. So when should you use linear regression analyses? The danger of having a software program that's easy to use like Jamovi it, and any of the others They'll let you read in a data set and do an analysis even if it's not appropriate for you to do that. So it's important for you to understand when you should use this and when you shouldn't. So a linear regression analysis is appropriate when you've got two, at least two variables and one of the variables helps explain the other one. For example, there might be a linear relationship between height and weight. Of course, it's not going to be exactly perfect, but the taller you are, the more likely you are to weigh. There may be a linear relationship between income and spending habits, uh, time studying and grades. And when you've got at least two variables, one of the variables is the independent variable. That's the one that predicts the outcome or the dependent variable. So height predicts weight. Your income might predict your spending habits. I don't know for sure that it does. I'm just using that as an example. Time studying may predict your grades. So the independent variable is the X. If you think back to your algebra days, on the coordinate plane when you graph a line, you've got X and Y. The dependent variable is Y. You put in X into the equation and it gives you a Y. A lot of math, including statistics, is a lot easier if you know the definition of the words. There's a tendency in math to have really complicated sounding words, even if the ideas are simple. When you have one independent variable, meaning one X, you've got a simple linear regression is what you're doing. If you have more than one independent variable, we call that a multiple linear regression. It might even be hierarchical, meaning things are subsets of each other, like students and then the school that they're in, the district that the school is in, where those are hierarchical. Control variables are when you control for a certain thing that is not of interest, but it might affect the outcomes. Like for example, if you're doing a linear regression analysis on whether or not a fertilizer helps a plant grow, you might want to control for sunlight or weather so that it's not a confounding variable. And categorical variables are qualitative categories that your data can be classified into that might matter, like gender. There might be a different relationship between height and weight for the different genders. I'm going to review just some basic things about a linear relationship because I've helped a lot of people analyze their data for their dissertations in non-mathematical fields like education and they don't remember any of this but everybody like learned it at one point in high school so I just want to review it because it'll make understanding what you're doing a lot easier. So what is a linear relationship? Remember y equals mx plus b is the equation of a line so here we've got the x-axis is the one that's horizontal and in the example of height and weight the x variable is the independent variable given height you can predict the weight so given the x you can predict the y and m is the slope that tells you how slanted the line is b is where the line crosses the y-axis Sometimes it doesn't make any sense for the independent variable to be zero, like with weight. Here, it could make sense. You might get a non-zero grade even if you don't study. If there's a negative correlation between your independent and dependent variables, like say the more you study, the worse your grade is, if <laughs> you're a bad study or something, um, the line would be a negative slope. M would be negative, and it goes from the left down to the right. That's a negative correlation between your dependent and independent variables. So here I have my data in an Excel spreadsheet. This is fake data, I made it up. And we've got height in inches, weight in pounds, average calories per day that the person eats, and then their gender. And I sorted this by weight, but you don't have to sort it. 
And now I'm going to open Jamovi and first I'll read my data in. And since I have it on my computer, I'm going to open it and it's weight height four. You see how easy that is? It just reads it in. Now I want to do a linear regression. So under analyses up here, I choose linear. And now it wants me to tell it what's my dependent variable. And the covariates are your independent variables, the x's. You can have more than one. We want weight to be our dependent variable. That's what we're going to predict the weight based on the height. And we'll just do a simple regression first. So I put those in there. And it gives me a model fit and then the coefficients. The intercept, that's b in the y equals mx plus b. The estimates here, it's estimating the coefficients. Intercept is b, and that 10.8 is the estimate of the coefficient on the variable that represents height. So y equals mx plus b would be y equals negative this number plus 10.8x. So using the estimates that we got from that linear regression, m was 10.8. So we could put in this formula to see what kind of predictions we're going to get. I just want you to see what all this means. So equals the height times 10.8, that's mx, the x is the height, plus, well, I'm just going to use minus, it's at minus 555.6. So this is the predicted weight, the height times 10.8 minus 556. So if we paste that formula down, see it's not exact. This guy weighs 128, but he's predicted to weigh 125 with this prediction formula. So there's a difference between what people actually weigh and what they're predicted, but it's a good, it's the best prediction that you can get from this data. So if we were to graph the actual data against the line, the predicted data comes out in a line. That's the regression line. The actual data is going to be some of it above the line, some of it below the line. And the difference between the predicted and the actual, like what we were just looking at in Excel, those are called the residuals. It's the difference. And the residual sum of squares, if you back when I was growing up, we had to do this stuff by hand. The uh, residual sum of squares is the sum of the distances of the actual versus predicted. But because some of the actual data points are below the line and some are above the line, if we just use the differences, they would cancel each other out because the ones below the line, the difference would be negative compared to the ones above the line would be positive. So that's why we square them before we add them together because squaring them gets rid of the negatives. And then we get a comparison of how good the dispersion is. And for a linear regression, you want this to be random. You need to have like a random pattern here. You can't have it shaped like a cone, like maybe down in the, for instance, in the example of income versus spending, the people with low income may not have very much difference between each other, whereas the people with high income might have a great amount of difference because they have a lot more leeway in their spending. And that would not be random. So you, you look at your scatter plot and you need to have kind of a random pattern of your actual data around the regression line in order for this to be a valid use of regression. So what do these things mean? What does R squared mean? R squared refers to the variance explained by the model. So that would be the variance in weight that's explained by the differences in height divided by the total variance. So this tells us 66.2% of the variance in weight is explained by the height. And you might wonder, was that good? 
well, when you're dealing with humans, there are so many variables that contribute and so many unexplained variables that anything over 0.5 on R squared is considered decent. If you're doing a linear regression on something that's like mechanical or, or doesn't have the variation that humans have, you need a much higher R squared. But 0.66 is, is okay for dealing with humans. So we also have a variable here of average number of calories. What if we add that to the covariates? So that means we're going to have another x, another independent variable. We can add that and see what it does to r square. r square went up to 0.86. So if we include the number of calories in the model, we increase the variability that we are accounting for up to 86%. And now we have another estimate here in the model coefficients. We've got the coefficient of 0.046 for calories. And let me show you what that means our equation of our, our linear equation would be. We now have two x's, which means you have like an xyz axis if you were going to try to graph it. But after one x, don't even try to imagine it. But it's just a, another dimension in our linearity. And so here, because we have put two independent variables in here. This is a multiple linear regression and we're doing the two simultaneously. So when we added the calories to the model, we got new estimates for all of the coefficients. It's now 0.86995 times the height and then we got the new 0 0.46 for the coefficient on calories, and then the y-intercept changed to minus 500 instead of minus 555. So I put that formula in here, and we're going to see what the new predictions are. So let me... Okay, see so these predictions should be mostly better. They're not changed by very much, but when they do change, they're going to be slightly better as far as the amount of the distance of the residuals to the prediction line overall. Now this multiple linear regression has these two independent variables, height and calories, in the model at the same time, or you might say simultaneously. So we know that they together they account for 86% of the variation, and we know these are the the different estimates for the, the coefficients in the linear equation, but what if you wanted to know how much each variable was bringing into the model? You might want to do them one at a time. Well, that's what the model builder is for here. Right now we've got in block one, we've got the two variables. What we can do is take calories out, add a block, and put calories in block two as a main effect. And what it does now, it shows us model one, the first variable that you put in, we know it brings 66% of the variation into the model. And then once we add two, it goes up to 86. But this lets you see how much is brought in by each one of these variables. And here on the model specific results, Model two, we've got both things, and those that's the same results that we got when we did them simultaneously. But you can switch to model one so you can see this is what it would have been if we had only had the one variable. And if you have a lot of variables, this is just a super handy, very nice feature of this software. Now the model builder is similar to a stepwise regression analysis, but in a stepwise regression analysis that's done by a computer software for you, it will first test everything and then it will add the variable that brings the accounts for the most variance in the outcome first, and then add the next one. The, this block analysis doesn't do that. And there can be drawbacks to stepwise analysis because it's very dependent on the data set that you have. And so it can give you uh, conclusions. You might draw conclusions that aren't actually true about the population as a whole. So this block analysis, the block linear regression analysis, allows you to put the variables in yourself and see how much each one brings to the model compared to what's already there. Now I want to look at 
the difference between the genders. So I put my dependent variable as weight, and that has to be a continuous variable, numbers. And I put gender as a factor. And what it shows me here is the gender is actually accounting for 43% of the variation almost. And that it takes for gender male minus female and gets 45. So in general, males weigh quite a bit more than females. And it is statistically significant because the p-value there tells you the probability that your sample, what you're seeing in your sample, you would also see in the major whole population. So let's go to the model builder now. And let's put in a second model. I'm going to put height. And that lets us bring it down here. And let's put in calories. And we want them in block two. So you have to put them in up here in order to get them to show up down here. So for block two, we're going to put calories as a main effect and height as another main effect. So I've just put them together and separate from gender. So we're looking at model one is gender and model two And we see that the change here, the change in R squared, is statistically significant. So although gender accounts for quite a bit of the difference in weight, when we add in the calorie intake and the height, the change in the amount of variance is statistically significant. Now one of the things that you want to look at, when we look at model one, down here the specific results, male-female difference is statistically significant. The weight of overall male and females is statistically different. If we go to model two, where we've got the other factors, you see how the T numbers change, but it's still significantly different in males and females. You might have a category where you have statistically significant difference in those two categories until you add other variables, and then maybe it won't be statistically different anymore. Now, I'm not going to go into everything on this video, but just one last thing here under save, you can check predicted values, residuals, and Cook's distance, and it will add those variables to your data set. So see here the first predicted values one, it, for all the females it has the, the prediction when you Model one was just males versus females. So all of the females are predicted to weigh the average weight for a female. And all the males are predicted to weigh the average weight for male. And then the second prediction, let me scroll back up. <clears throat> That's the model where we put in the height and the average calorie consumption in a day and here's the prediction that you get, which is a much better prediction. The residual is how far off you are from the actual. And Cook's distance, what that tells you is the amount of influence this individual data point had on the overall results. Uh, for example, outliers are going to have a lot more influence on the results than data points that were close to the prediction. If you have a lot of outliers, Re linear regression may not be a good model. So you want these numbers to be low, and these numbers are all pretty low, so we look good. I'm not going to go into the assumption checks, but those are important. I think I have shown you enough to get you started, and hopefully you'll have a good understanding of how to interpret what you're seeing.